Hello, my name is Sam and in November of 2016 I applied to be a pilot for the Royal Air Force and throughout 2017 I've been going through the application process uh, and in two weeks time, or under two weeks time now, I'll be going to RAF Holston for my basic training to um, train eventually as a weapon systems operator. So I was given my provisional offer of service and I'll start my training in two weeks which is really cool. Um, I'll tell you in the video why it, why it uh, changed or why my, why my role changed from pilot to WISOP. Um, it's due to a medical issue uh, which was unfortunate but can't do anything about that so can't dwell on it. And uh, but yeah, I'll go into a bit more detail throughout the video. Why am I making this video? Well, one for me um, to reflect on in the future. Uh, you know, you can forget things um, that happened a little while ago and I don't want to be forgetting this year because it has been really good fun and a lot of hard work and I put a lot of effort into it um, so it's a, for me something to look back on and show my um, friends and family is good and also for anyone that's going through the application process now if I can give any tips or just some insight uh, just comfort you on some things maybe some myths um, that might be thrown around and then that will be good um, for you so this isn't a how to get through the application process video um, there isn't really a video that you can watch, or there isn't a video you can watch that will tell you, you know, if you do this, you'll pass. Um, it's all about your preparation, and you know, if you've got any questions, if I say something that you're not sure on, contact your careers office, as that's what they're for. So the information in this video will be a personal account from my personal experience going through this process. Uh, so that the application process may have changed by the time you're watching this video. So if you're, in, if you're in doubt, contact the careers office and always resort to the careers office for um, up-to-date information. Just use this video as maybe supplemental research um, in helping you understand a bit more uh, about the application process and hopefully it will, it will help you. So after applying online, about two and a half weeks after that, um, I was informed of the P2 presentation, uh, which I could attend. It was optional. Uh, I don't know if now you have to go to this, uh, but when I when I did it, it was optional, and I chose to go to it because, uh, you know, why not? It's going to help you out, so you might as well. And basically, it is a presentation that will take you through the application process. You can write down notes, ask any questions you want, and meet other people that are going through the same thing as you. So on the 2nd of February 2017, I turned up to my careers office for the P2 presentation, knocked on the door, came in, sat down. There was about 10 others that were waiting in the waiting room as well. We were then herded into a room to get the brief by the officer and he welcomed us in. We did an icebreaker to start with. So we all got up at the front, or one at a time, got up to the front, said who we were, what role we're going for, why we want to join the RAF and what we're interested in, like hobby-wise. So nothing too heavy. It was quite nice to see some other people that have got you know, same interests as you and going for the same roles as you so you can speak to them and get little tips from them what they're doing preparation wise. And I hadn't prepared for the presentation, uh, there wasn't any need to in my case. If on the email that you get it says you need to know this or that, um, then I would do that. But for my case, we didn't need to know anything for the presentation. Uh, it was just to come along, sit down, be presented with information and, and take it down in notes. And the key tip I would have for anyone going to the P2 presentation is make sure you take notes and make sure beforehand you have questions that you want to ask them. Because uh, there's nothing worse than you know, being in the room wanting to ask a question or wanting to or trying to think of a question uh, while information is being spewed at you, which you need to write down. So get some questions that you've thought of beforehand so then you can ask them when the time comes. And that was it really. There's, there's not much to talk about the presentation. It is good. I would recommend going to it and take lots of notes. So the aptitude test for me was two and a half weeks after the pre-2 presentation and it took place at RAF Cranwell in Lincolnshire. So to get there I got the train, uh, the train tickets were provided by the careers office which uh, was good. Uh, I don't have a car, I've only got a motorbike so taking my kit up on that and looking smart probably wouldn't have been the best idea as uh, so a train was the way to go. So I arrived at Grantham Station met another guy that was actually going for uh, Royal Navy pilot, going for the Fleet Air Arm in the Navy, and uh, sort of talked to him, sat in the coffee shop uh, and waited for our, for our bus to arrive. Now we had a sheet of paper that had the, the times when the bus was going to 
turn up. So usually when you look at the bit of paper and it says, let's say, five o'clock, um, you would assume that that is when the bus would turn up. But in this case, it was when the bus left. So just before five o'clock, we, we got up, uh, ready to wait outside for the, for the bus, and we saw it drive straight past us, which obviously wasn't a good start. So we had to wait another hour and a half for the next bus, which was a shame because then we missed dinner, so it was the spa shop for us when we when we got to, to Cranwell that uh, we had to that we had to deal with. Uh, but when we when we got to Cranwell, we signed we went into the guard room, signed in, got our photo taken, and we were given a little pass and it said CBAT on it uh, for your computer-based aptitude testing. You have to wear that all the time when you're around the base, so they know who you are and what you're there for. So this was my first time on a RAF base and it was really cool to see all the planes flying around. We've got the Grob Tutor and the King Air B200 going really low overhead and there was also a Takanu that did a fly past um, so that was really cool. So after dinner uh, it was off to bed and ready to get up the next morning nice and early to get ready for the aptitude test. So I got up at about 5.30, had a shower, the hot water hadn't been turned on yet so uh, it was a cold one. If they tell you to get up at like six o'clock, get up at six o'clock. There's no need really to get to get up earlier, uh, which a lot of people, including myself, did, and uh, found you know you don't you don't need to. Uh, if you want to, then fine, go for it. But um, there's no need really. Everyone got dressed up into their suits and ties and waited downstairs for the uh, little coach to arrive to take us to breakfast. Key point to note here: make sure you wear something smart. Smart shoes, smart trousers shirt and tie, blazer if you have one, or uh, just a full on suit, uh, that is what they will expect. And it just shows uh, respect in a sense, you know, you're, you're on an RAF base, you want to look presentable, uh, you're in a military establishment, and it will show that you take pride in your appearance. So, you know, another tick in the box, something just minor that will uh, also make you feel good about yourself. If you're looking good, feeling good, then you'll probably perform better. So after breakfast, we got back into the coach and went over to Adastral Hall, which is where your CBAT takes place. We waited in this like blue room with lots of blue chairs, uh, which I'd seen from videos of OESC. Um, so it was quite cool to be in that room and see it in real life. And then we waited for one of the officers to come down and take us into the briefing room. And there was a guy that gave us a brief on how to use the aptitude equipment. So it was like this special keyboard with different buttons that do different things. Key point to note here, make sure you listen to that person who is briefing you on how to use that keyboard and the equipment for your aptitude test. You don't want to be the person that presses the wrong button and like, deletes your, your, your score from the last test. Um, so just make sure you listen and you'll be fine. Now for myself going for the pilot role, I think we had to do like all the tests. So for me it was, what have we got here? because I've got notes here, I'm referring to them. It was about nine, eight or nine hours and I was sat in the room on the computer and every half an hour you've got a five minute break. Key point to note, take every break that you can, go into the other room that's available to you, get a drink of water, have a little snack if you've, if you've brought it with you and it will just keep your brain active. One of the things that I should have done is bring food with me. Uh, I didn't realise that we could take food with us into the into the area, but just you know, take a little, uh, just take a little snack bar or banana with you in your pocket um, on your way to a dashboard hall, and you'll be able to put it into that room beforehand. Make sure you keep hydrated and walk around, chill out when you have your your breaks, um, but stay quiet when you're work, walking through the corridors, of course. So the aptitude test itself is really fun, even though it was it was long, and it will depend on what role you're going for, um, how long the the whole the whole test in total is. Uh, but there were tests that were like video games, there were tests that needed a bit of thinking, tests that needed a lot of thinking, and some tests that I thought I did absolutely rubbish on. Uh, but it's just a case of doing the best you can on each test, and your mental math revision, your speed distance time revision, your angles and bearings revision will come in very handy when you um, take part in, in the aptitude. So after the aptitude test, you go down, back down to the waiting room and are handed your results by one of the guys at reception. And this was pretty instant. I walked in and they said my name like, as I walked through the door and handed me it, so that was quite nice. So I was able to see my score straight away. And thankfully I passed for pilot and all the other ones that I'd uh, wanted to pass for as my sort of second and third option, which uh, for your information is RPAS pilot and 
uh, Wizop, which was the, the choices that I wanted to, to go for, my three options. So yeah, it was great, great, to, great news to see that I passed. And you get a brief by one of the personnel there, and they'll tell you what the next stage is for you. Uh, if you haven't passed on your branch, then they'll give you careers advice, tell you what your options are. Um, if you have passed, then um, great, well done you, on to the next thing. So just under a month after my aptitude test, I had my filter interview. Um, so that was dated for the 15th of March, but then I pushed that back to the end of March so then I had some more time to revise as that's what I felt I needed to do. Um, you know, whether or not you want to do that yourself is completely up to you and whether or not the careers office can do that, but luckily for me, they were able to do that. And it gave me that extra time just to get the revision together and get it in my in, get it ingrained in my head. So the filter interview enables the officer or person interviewing you to check how motivated you are, how much preparation you've done and how determined you are with um, your application process. I personally put a lot of effort into the filter interview, um, so much so like I said I extended the date so I had more time to prepare. Um, I think I had about a month and a half in total from the CBAT to prepare for the for the filter interview and for me that was worth it and was something that I just chose to do and gave me time to go over everything and make sure I got the right information in my head. So some of the questions um, that they will ask you relate to yourself, relate to the RAF, relate to your motivation, relate to current affairs, um, where the RAF are currently operating, you know, what aircraft they have, where they're based. Um, potentially what squadron they um, sort of operate those aircraft and the interview should last around 45 minutes because I've done so much preparation and I had a lot of knowledge in my head the officer just seemed to to, to gauge that and continue to ask me questions and go deeper and deeper into sort of what knowledge I did know and for me the interview was about an hour and a half um, and speaking to other people since the filter interview and um, they all had shorter ones than mine so obviously the more information you have the the better sort of you're prepared and the more motivation you show to that officer who is interviewing you. Now there are various videos on YouTube and various forums on the student room um, that will tell you or give you sort of a list of, of questions that could potentially be asked um, and I'm going to go through what I've got written down in my chunk of notes here, it's about 20 pages I think, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the, um, the questions uh, and if you, if you want to note them down and then create your answer for yourself and then that will be a good, good aid for research for you. Um, so first things first is about you, so education, your, so what grades did you get, where did you go, uh, how did you find school, college, uni life? Uh, responsibilities and achievements, so what responsibilities and achievements did you achieve or do during school, college and university and beyond. Um, spare time activities, what do you like to do in your free time. Employment, where have you been employed. Uh, try and get the date and year, if you can't get uh, the date and year, try and get the month and year. Uh, if you can't get the month then um, the year is, is fine I guess. I would double check with the careers office what level of detail they want you to go into. Uh, so what position of responsibility did you have during that employment? Uh, what was your major sporting achievement and how did you get involved with that? What youth organisations have you been involved in? What would you like to do in your spare time? I think I said that already. Um, what adventure training have you done? Any part-time jobs you've taken part in? For me, my part-time or my jobs that I've done uh, have all been part-time jobs so far as I've been going through school and college so can't do full-time. Um, travel, what travel have you done? What's your most significant achievement? And did you do, get, uh, did you do a gap year or go to higher education? Uh, what have you done since college? Um, for myself I didn't go to university so I wrote uh, sort of some notes on why I didn't go to university. Um, community involvement, what community involvement have you done, uh, what did you achieve, what was that all about. Fitness, so how, how are you keeping fit and then they'll probably want to know what how, how many press ups you can do in a minute, how many sit ups you can do in a minute and uh, what sort of 
uh, bleak test score you're getting as well. Uh, what's the most adventurous thing you've done? Uh, your high point of your life to date? Well, I'm literally just going to read through all these questions. You can skip if you're just watching this. Um, you can skip this if you want, but by all means take notes uh, and then expand on those questions for your own research. So this is sort of part two of my notes, which is more RAF based. So your motivation to join the RAF, why do you want to join the RAF? Why not the Army or Navy? Uh, what prompted your interest to join the services? If you're going for a, a commissioned role, so um, if, you're going, if you want to be an officer, what is a commission? Um, so you talk about what that is, what you'll receive, a um, little hint, a commissioning scroll, and what a commission enables you to do. Uh, what is a non-commissioned officer? What would you describe as your personal strengths? What can you improve on? What do you think the impact of your life will be when joining the services? Why did you choose to apply for the role you've applied for? And what do you understand about the length of service? And what is the RAF reserve commitment when you leave the service? Uh, massive amounts of detail on training. So if you're going for officer role, an officer role, know about initial officer training. I remembered every week uh, what is going to happen. Um, I can't remember that now because it's been a little while since I did the interview. So um, I remembered it week by week. You can print out a sort of spreadsheet of, or not a spreadsheet, uh, a uh, timetable of what happens. And if you can remember that, great. Or if you can get just like the brief summary of, of what it is, then do that, whatever's best for you. Um, the careers office again will tell you how much detail they will want from you. So after your basic training, go into detail about your like phase two training. So if you're going to be, if you're applying for a pilot, where's your flying training? How long is it? What aircraft you're going to fly? What you're going to learn when you're there? Um, not just flying wise, so like aerobatics or air combat or um, emergency drills, but on the ground as well. So maybe like meteorology, um, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, how does your training develop you in the classroom and in the field and uh, what will you learn academically what do you think will challenge you the most and how will you cope with training and then again on this one I've gone all like the additional flying training as I was going for pilot so all about elementary flying training fast jet training where that is how long that is what you're learning there rotary training where that is how long it is and so on uh, so just learn all about your training for your branch. How did your career develop as you go on tours? And how did your chosen branch sit in deployed operations? Um, quite a key one here. What do you understand about air power? Um, so you can look up all about air power, how it affects um, the UK and the world, how it's affected us since, since the war, really, since World War II. Uh, what are the three characteristics of air power? What are the four roles of air power? And I'll give you those um, in case you can't find them and you can expand on them. Um, so the three characteristics of air power are height, speed and reach. And the four roles of air power are control of the air, intelligence and situational awareness, attack and air mobility. Um, so you can expand on that, research that for yourself. Um, give examples of air power, so know the RAF's aircraft, uh, what they do, what weapons they have. Um, you don't need to, or I didn't go into detail sort of about the engines and um, how many sort of jelly beans that you can fit in the back of an aircraft, you know, all that stuff. If you want to go into that detail, you can. If not, um, that is up to you. But again, if you're not sure, resort to the careers office. Uh, next, I went over operations that the RAF are carrying out and have carried out. Um, you can research that yourself. It's very easy. Just type in RAF current operations and there will be information on that. Uh, right. And then we've got stuff about NATO. So when was NATO formed? Why was it formed? Uh, what was the response from NATO being formed? Who were the last countries to join NATO? Uh, why was NATO in Afghanistan, uh, the difference between NATO and the UN, uh, and then I've got stuff about current affairs. So for me, I needed to know five global topics and five UK topics. Um, 
I would get up to date information on that from your careers office because that may have changed. Um, so you just want to be safe with that one. Also try and remember some of the RAF stations um, around the UK, as many as you can. You'll probably get asked um, you know, what stations or name some stations that the RAF has. So for example, I have Odium, got the Chinooks there, I have Benson, I have Shawbury, you know, that sort of thing. For the initial officer training, this is the course breakdown, you can find this online. Um, so what I did, I remembered like week one to three, I'm doing that. Week four, I'm doing that. Week five, I'm doing that. Um, if you can remember that off by heart, great. Um, if not, you know, try and remember as much as, as possible. I don't know if they expect you to know it all. Again, talk to the careers office. I don't want to give you the wrong advice. This is just what I did. Okay. After the filter interview, I was taken into the waiting room of my careers office. I waited for about 10 to 15 minutes uh, and then was sent back into the interview room where I was told I'd been selected to go to off the Officer and Aircrew Selection Centre, which was great, so that meant I passed. Um, so after that um, filter interview, about a month after I had a medical and it was just a civilian type medical to, to do a general check over. Um, that wasn't the place where I found out my medical issue that, which hindered me from becoming a pilot. That was at OESC where you do the medical there um, and I'll tell you about that in the next section. Um, but yeah, the, the sort of civilian medical um, done by the firm Capita. It was just a general easy medical, go there, get looked at, come back home, sorted. I also did a station visit at the end of March to RF Odium. If you get the opportunity to do a station visit, I would highly recommend that. If you haven't had the opportunity to do that, then you can contact your careers office and organize it through them. They'll give you an email address um, and you can organize it with them. Um, and they are really good. You get a good insight into what life is like on base, what the role you want to do is like. Um, so for me, applying to be a pilot, I was able to go to RF Odium go look at the Chinooks, go into the Chinooks, sit in the pilot seat, uh, have a good look around and meet some of the pilots and talk to them about their role. So after the filter interview and after the civilian medical, I got my date for OASC. And that was on the 5th of September 2017. So it was about five or six months after the filter interview that I actually went to OASC. Uh, and this was good. Uh, in, a, in a sense because it gave me enough time to prepare for it, to get enough research for it. All the notes that you have for your filter interview, keep them um, because you have an interview at OESC which is, for me, it wasn't in as much detail but it was very quick. Um, so if you've got it ingrained in your mind and they ask you a question, um, straight away you'll know the answer and you can just say it. Okay. Um, but OESC was something that I was looking forward to and were quite, was quite nervous as well uh, because it is, in my opinion, and for me it was the, the sort of main place that I needed to prove myself um, to get the role that I wanted to do. So it was a good six months of uh, working hard, hard on my fitness and preparing myself for each task that happens over the three days that I was there. So OESC took place at RF Cranwell, uh, so back up to Cranwell like in the aptitude test. Same again with transport, I got the train there. Um, careers office provided train tickets which was great and there was quite a bit more um, that I took that time clothes wise because it's three days rather than the CBAT only being one. I made sure I was smart again this is the place where you want to um, look good uh, so suit or smart trousers, shirt tie with a blazer uh, which is what I had that is what you want to be wearing. Um, during the tasks you'll be wearing green sort of overalls with a bib and a letter and number on you, I was F2, um, but we'll get to that in a bit and I'll tell you about all what uh, what happened. So I arrived at Cranwell and it was the evening. We had a brief just uh, by the commanding officer saying welcoming, welcoming us to OASC um, and explaining what's going to happen over the next few days. It was a three day event, so we got there on the first day and then day two and three were your testings. So when going to OSC, make sure you take all your documents with you, so all your grades and your uh, national insurance number, passport, all, all those documents that you took to the filter interview, take to OSC as well, um, as you will need them. And also um, be prepared to write a about me type um, essay 
it's quite short and there is a way you need to structure it. Um, the piece of paper that you get when you're there will tell you exactly how you need to write it and, and you can do that. Uh, and also when you're writing your details on the forms that you're given, um, there's a set way that you need to do it as well. So pay attention to what the form says and how you need to write it. So OESC is three days. You get there, or I got there on the first day, and then you have the second day, which is group exercises, and then the third day, which is sort of more individual. Um, you have to pass the second day to get on to the last day. Um, so if you don't pass the second day, uh, you'll be sent home, um, which is very uh, nerve-wracking when you're you know, waiting for that result. Uh, so I'll take you through what the exercises are and what I felt I um, struggled in and what I felt I did well in. First thing first, getting to know everyone. Everyone is nervous, everyone was um, excited also to be there uh, and everyone had a sort of a game plan in our, in our team. Uh, we wanted to make sure everyone got a chance to, to speak up uh, and if you're going to OSC, make sure that you tell others, um, you know, spread the effort around and give people a chance to talk because although you are competing with each other to a certain extent, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a group, they want to see a group and team effort as well and want to see that you're able to work well in the team. So after a sleepless night on the, uh, on the first day, I got up relatively early, probably about I think half five, six o'clock, it was about six o'clock and uh, had a shower, got changed and went down for breakfast. Um, that was nice, the breakfast there are good, full English, 10 out of 10. And then it was straight off to Ad Astral Hall, uh, to the blue room, uh, the blue waiting area to await our instructions and it was very fast paced. When we got there, we sat down, we waited for a little bit uh, and once the exercises started going, it, it was a, a seamless day. There was no there was no errors with the organisation of the people there, uh, which was good. So we got given our overalls and our bibs. I was F2, so we were Team Foxtrot. And the first thing that we did was to go and do the group discussion. So myself and our group were marched off um, very quickly up to a room, and we were straight into this uh, group discussion. You have a board of people sat at one end of the room, uh, or board of officers, and then you, your, your group sit in a circle facing the uh, officers and uh, they'll give you a topic and, and you, you respond and speak within your group. Um, the first, the topics I can't actually remember, it was something about the government, something else about, yeah I can't actually remember, uh, but the questions will be changed and you can't predict what they're gonna, what they're gonna ask you, it could be anything. Try and speak up, uh, I was lucky enough to be the first one to you know speak first which was a a good good thing uh, but it doesn't matter if, if you you know if you don't speak up first as long as you put in um, your say put an equal amount of, of conversation into the discussion and uh, that's what you're aiming for really um, in my in my experience of it again I I don't know how they mark you um, but for the group discussion put your say in uh, make valid contributions and enable other people to speak as well and respond to that. Always make sure you're uh, listening, like nodding when they say something you agree with or if you don't agree with it maybe um, shake your head and uh, they may come to you and say oh you're shaking your head why don't you agree with this and you can like expand the conversation from there. So the group discussion I felt went well um, I we all said our part, we all spoke up, we were all clear and uh, we were feeling good afterwards so after each exercise you go into a waiting room um, to wait for the next one so we had a nice little talk on uh, how we thought we did. Um, if A good point to note, if you feel like you haven't done your best, um, try not to stress about it because you have the whole day um, to sort of bump yourself up and make more contributions. And the next exercise which was, I've just got it up on here, the group planning one, uh, for me was my worst exercise and I thought it went terribly wrong for myself and um, so I'll explain that now. So you and your group go into a room and you're given a scenario to read over for yourself first, um, take notes and then you're given a, a time to discuss what um, solution you've found uh, for, for this problem. Now for me I hadn't found a solution for the problem um, so I was panicking a bit 
uh, trying to listen to what the others were saying and I didn't I didn't feel as if I was speaking up as much as I should have been. Then came the time where uh, we had to discuss our final plan and again I still honestly didn't have any idea how they were working out the solution that they had and what was happening uh, but I just tried to make sure that I did speak uh, or ask questions uh, just be sort of seen in the group as someone who is contributing even though in my mind I was panicking so much and then at the end we presented our idea uh, and luckily I was because of the notes that I was writing from the discussion I knew to a certain extent what we were doing um, so when the officer asked me okay F2 what is uh, your plan after you get to that bit I knew the answer and I could say that um, but afterwards I felt <laughs> I felt awful I was like have I mucked up this this OESC completely because of this task um, my emotions were sort of going all over the place uh, but it was good good learning experience could there have been anything um, that I'd improve or that I could have improved on before going into the group planning maybe trying to find some more planning exercises and getting my head around a, a technique of working them out um, because you can find planning exercises online then came the hangar familiarization brief um, so we're all Put in, uh, went into the hangar, which is like a big, well, a big massive hangar, um, full of sort of little separated areas with tasks uh, to do. The officer showed us the rules, and there are rules that you have to, to stick by. So like red is out, white and blue is in, something like that. Um, only a certain amount of people on, on one apparatus at a time. You can only bridge a plank of wood in this certain way um, so make sure you're you're, you're t switched on for that uh, and you remember all the rules and then you don't hinder yourself or your team later on in, in the hangar task and after the brief had finished uh, we went on to the leaderless exercise so our group Foxtrot, Foxtrot group uh, went over to this task and we basically had to get from one side to the other using a certain amount of um, pieces of equipment uh, in a certain amount of time and we were assessed on how we communicated and uh, it was good fun it was a it was a nice sort of relief from the um, group planning exercise which I thought I did awful on to then come to, a, to the leaderless exercise and have a bit of fun have a good laugh um, and even though it's it's a, a sort of serious time you know you're, you're wanting to be your best uh, you still you know enjoyed it um, because it's it's quite fun climbing over things, trying to get from one place to another without touching the floor. And for our group, uh, within the time limit, we didn't actually complete the task, uh, but that didn't seem to be a problem. Uh, we just carried on to the next task. After the leaderless task came the leadership task or the command situation, which was a diff, which was in the hangar still. Um, but each person from our group had a chance at being the leader and directing the team across from one side to the other. Uh, this again was good, everyone was very um, good at communicating with each other and listen to the leader. Uh, if someone in your team has said an idea and you think that you could improve on that, uh, don't be afraid to say it um, because you might find that your idea will work and then obviously that's more points for you. Uh, looks good and also you've, you know, you've listened to your, your teammate, thought of a better solution and had the confidence to say, you know, this solution is good but if we do it this way, and then it can, it might be better. So key points for the leaderless and leadership tasks in the hangar, be loud, be clear, uh, make sure you listen to all the, the special rules and work with your team. Don't try and do things on your own. After the command situation uh, came the individual planning exercise. Uh, this for me was better than the group planning one. I did panic a little bit um, when trying to figure out a solution, uh, but basically what happens is you go into a room, um, you're sat next to other people, but you're sort of blocked off with screens either side. You have a situation and you need to note down um, your solution. You'll then go into the briefing room uh, by yourself. There'll be a board of officers, uh, there'll be a sort of board with a map, and you explain your situation, what's happening, uh, who is involved, where you're going to go and how you're going to get there. Uh, and then, you're, then I went and sat down opposite the officer and she asked me questions um, and I answered them. Uh, pretty standard, it was good, again I was trying to be clear with my communication 
I try to explain things um, thoroughly. Um, and there were a few things that when she asked me I didn't know and I sort of hesitated um, but it didn't seem to be a problem uh, you know she just pushed me on and uh, gave me another question which I might be able to answer which I did and that is the second day of OESC so it's a, it's a long day it's fast paced it's quite stressful and then the worst bit really of OESC I think is the, the weight from the evening of the second day to the morning of the third where you find out if you've passed that second day because we I think we finished about four o'clock in the afternoon so we had the whole afternoon and evening and then all night to think about oh have I done enough have I mucked up on this I should have done this better um, but main thing to know don't beat yourself up on things you can only give your best shot uh, and that's that's what I did and uh, then it was on to the third day. So the third day consists of finding out if you've passed the second day and then you have your medical interview and fitness test. So I woke up on the third day in the morning um, same time sort of six o'clock ish half five six o'clock um, butterflies in my stomach and everything you know apprehensive of what what the result might be. Uh, we all went down to breakfast and then went to Adastral Hall again to wait in our uh, what for our results. Everyone was a lot more quiet <laughs> this time. It was you could feel the tension in the air, uh, just waiting for the officer to come in. And when he did, everyone perked up, uh, and we got ferried off over to um, one of the corners of the room, sat down, and heard our fate. Now, one of my friends that I got in contact with, or I, I sort of made friends with on, along the uh, application process, had been to OASC a few days before me, and had said that there were ten people on his OASC course and only five got through to the final day so I was a I was a bit worried you know if they can chop that many people out you know 50 percent how many are they going to cut out of our lot because there was 20 people uh, 21 people in, in total um, but the officer came in and uh, we went and sat down and only two people out of the 21 didn't pass so you know it was good for all, all of us it was quite a, a happy time when uh, we uh, when we found out that we passed uh, but it shows that you know there isn't a set sort of amount of people that they can take in if if you've got to OASC then I'm sure there is a, a space for you and you just need to prove um, yourself and your and your pass um, you know there could be I'm sure there has been situations before where only out, out of the whole group that goes to OASC um, only one person passes you know if if you've got what it takes if you if you prove to them you have potential because it is all about potential and um, then you'll pass and uh, move on with the application. So when you find out that you've passed the second day of OASC you then move on to your medical interview and fitness test. Now for myself going for the role of pilot there are other medical standards that I need to meet uh, to make sure that I'm eligible, eligible for that role. Um, so you do eyesight tests, you do ear tests, so audio tests, uh, they take your blood pressure, they um, take blood as well out of your arm and test that. Uh, we in a pot and they'll test your wee, all the standard stuff. Uh, and they'll also measure you. Now this is what hindered me unfortunately from becoming a pilot. Um, I am <laughs> freakishly tall and I was four and a half centimetres too tall on my uh, sitting height for uh, for for pilot which you know I can't do much about and I would have been more annoyed if I would have failed on something that I could have prepared on more um, but because I failed or because I didn't meet the criteria um, for pilot because of my height uh, there's nothing I can do about that and I can't dwell on it because it's me so it just wasn't meant to be. I had sort of expected that there would be a height limit for um, the role of pilot. So throughout my whole application, I had the thing in my, I had the thought in my mind that uh, there is a potential that it could hinder me, uh, and it did, uh, and that's just the way it went, unfortunately. Um, but there are other roles that have height restrictions as well, which I didn't realise. So when I was there um, discussing what options uh, I had other than pilot, um, ARP has pilot and weapon systems officer uh, both had uh, height restrictions 
um, so I wasn't able to, to go for them either. Uh, whether or not that changes, if it's changed and us tool lot can, can go for pilots in the future, then good for you. Um, that's great. But for me, I had to go for weapon system, or I chose uh, weapon systems operator as that's what I thought uh, would give me the best career uh, fulfillment. There were officer roles that I could have gone for, like aerospace battle manager, um, there was also air traffic control officer, um, I didn't get intelligence officer on my CBAT so I couldn't go for that. Uh, and when I was weighing up the option of, you know, do I want to be an officer in the RAF, you know, or do I want um, to go for still a, a relatively senior position role, um, an SNCO role for weapon systems operator, you know, you go in as a sergeant, um, but for, for career fulfillment, I thought, for me personally, becoming uh, a part of the air crew would be an amazing adventure, and that's why I, I chose um, in the debrief to to have weapon systems operator as my uh, new first choice. Yeah, I think the I think the staff that measured me and debriefed me were quite shocked in and the calmness that I felt when I was told that I, I couldn't be a pilot because I'm I've heard stories of people breaking down in tears, uh, which I which I can understand. You know, if you wanted to be a pilot all your life and or a pilot in the RAF all your life and you can't because of um, a medical issue it you know it sucks really but uh, you just have to suck it up and think of the next best op best option um, as quick as you can really and move on so after the medical uh, came the interview um, because I've been going through the application process to become a pilot I uh, had the interview about the pilot role um, so I didn't have to suddenly know all this information about uh, weapon systems operator and um, I had to do that for the final 308 interview which I'll talk about in a bit uh, but for OSC I did the interview for the pilot role. Um, it was very very fast paced, uh, a lot quicker fast paced than a lot, a lot quicker paced than the filter interview, it only lasted for about half an hour uh, literally got in, shook both their hands sat down and boom, question, answer, question, answer. Um, it was really good, you know, just bouncing off each other um, the the answers, um, showing my knowledge, motivation, uh, why I wanted to join the RAF, all that stuff. Um, similar questions, or basically exactly the same questions as the filter interview, but less of. Uh, so as long as you're up to date on your um, notes and you've prepared for that and you have them in your mind, uh, know all about the training, you know, all, all your filter interview notes, keep them in your mind, keep them fresh, and uh, that would do you good for that interview. And then finally came the fitness test. Now, you can find out on the RF website what the uh, fitness test requirements are. So for me, uh, being 19, uh, my bleep test score, I had to get 9.10 on the bleep test. Uh, Press-ups, I had to get 20 in a minute and sit-ups I had to get 35 in a minute and at OASC there are sections or like different grades um, you can get so you have red, yellow, green, light blue and dark blue. Um, red means you fail like if you couldn't if you only did like if you did no press-ups in the minute you know it's a red um, so you and then yellow is a is a fail also. Um, so you want to be getting green or above. Green being 9.10 on the beat test, 20 press ups, 20, or 35 sit ups, or whatever your age category um, states you need to achieve. Uh, and then there's the sections or uh, grades above of that where you can uh, sort of score extra points. And that's what I was aiming for. Um, I prepared myself physically uh, very well and was able to achieve 12.2 on the bleep test which is my best score uh, and I was amazed with that and I think going um, doing the bleep test with all, all the others gives you that extra bit of adrenaline and pushes you uh, and when you're in that environment you know you, you wanted to you wanted to show off you know you want to push on hard and um, then you can just uh, go for it and you'll blitz it uh, press ups I did 40 and sit ups I did 48 in a minute I believe um, so yeah, that was fine. Fitness test was all good, and then it uh, it was OEC done. Uh, just a case of waiting uh, a few weeks to find out my result, and that is what I will talk about next.
So three weeks after OSC, I received my result, and it stated the following. Dear, my name, following your attendance at the Officers and Aircrew Selection Centre, I am pleased to inform you that you've been provisionally selected for service as a weapon systems operator. <laughs> so, honestly, I was very excited, and I sat there staring at the, uh, staring at the screen for a very long time, not saying anything. And then I rang everyone and told them that I uh, got my provisional offer. So that was great. Um, a good big relief, uh, sigh of relief and happiness that all the uh, hard work has paid off. Um, so that was, a, that was a really nice day. So after my result, I uh, received an email about a week afterwards um, saying that I need to do a, a pre-recruit training course for RF Holton. And if you get accepted for an officer role, then you'll have a familiarisation visit at RAF Cranwell. Um, and the PRTC for me uh, was three days. Uh, well, actually, no, it was two days. Uh, it was really good fun. Uh, nothing, to, nothing to worry about. A series of um, simple tests. Uh, the fitness test, uh, rather than doing the max effort one like OESC, you only had to hit the, um, the minimum pass mark. And you had to walk around in these. These very lovely green overalls, uh, which are quite comfy, you know, good amount of pockets and things. Um, so marching around in these with little high vis vests on was good fun, and it was nice to see what uh, the place where I'm going to be living for ten weeks, uh, RF Holton, is going to be like. Uh, the food was great. It was good to see people marching around and being in that environment, and I'm very excited for that. Um, then came the 308 interview. Uh, which was a few weeks after, uh, no it wasn't, it was two months, two months after the uh, um, PRTC was the 308 interview and that is literally um, a skim over of basic knowledge of, of what role you're getting into and then filling in and signing paperwork, um, so nothing to worry about there really. Uh, and now, as I will show you down here, I'm getting all my kit together um, to go off to Holton in a few weeks time and uh, yeah so it's good stuff so hopefully this video has been helpful and if it has leave a little comment down below uh, you can ask me any questions I'll try to answer them and I should be able to answer them and uh, wish me luck for uh, Holton.